So at about 3.30 yesterday afternoon, uh, the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office responded to the Circle A convenience store at 1201 Sunset Point Road in Clearwater. And what we know from the investigation is, is that uh, Marquise McLaughlin, who is a 28-year-old African-American male, had arrived at the store uh, with his girlfriend, Brittany Jacobs. Uh, Brittany parked their car uh, in a handicapped spot uh, by the store. Uh, Marquise and his son, who's five years old, uh, went into the store. Uh, another person uh, by the name of Michael Draca, who's 47 years old, white male, arrived at the store. He lives in the area and was a uh, frequent customer of the store. And somebody who others have said complained about people parking in the handicapped spots. And he had an issue with people who illegally parked in handicapped spots and at that store. So apparently, uh, Draca gets out of his car and is checking around Jacob's car and looking for handicapped decals or permits or anything that would authorize them to park where they did. When he didn't see that, uh, he confronted uh, Jacob's and by all accounts is, is that they got into a, a pretty significant yelling match and there was no physical violence, there was no threats, but it was a disturbance and that they were yelling at each other and he was complaining uh, about her parking in the handicapped spot. Uh, there was another customer there at the store and the customer uh, went inside and told a store employee that there was a disturbance in the parking lot and that he should do something about it which was interpreted to mean probably call the police. At that point uh, Marquise McLaughlin was in the store and uh, learned of the disturbance in the parking lot and it appears uh, that he learned that uh, it was his girlfriend Br Brittany Jacobs who was involved in this verbal altercation uh, with uh, Draca. So he exits the store and when he exits the store and it is captured on video and we'll show you the video here in a second um, he walks out the door and walks straight toward meaning he meaning Draco walks straight toward McLaughlin and by all witness accounts there was no verbalization there were no statements that were exchanged between McLaughlin and Draco um, let the video pretty much speak for itself, uh, but what it, I'll characterize it this way is, is that McLaughlin um, approached uh, Draca. He didn't waste any time getting to him, and then he pushed him, but it isn't just a push. He really slammed him to the ground is what it is, and he pushed him with great force. I mean, this is a violent uh, push. This wasn't a shove. This wasn't just a tap. It was with his hands, and he slammed him to the ground, so Draca falls back. And as Draco falls back, he is on his rear end on the ground. And at that point, uh, McLaughlin is still a few feet away. McLaughlin is facing Draco, and Draco is on the ground. And when Draco had been slammed to the ground, he then reaches, because he's a concealed carry permit holder, and he can lawfully carry a concealed firearm, he, re he reaches and takes out his firearm. And at that point, uh, McLaughlin is still, again, a few feet away. He's facing Draca. Looks like he's starting to turn a little bit, uh, maybe as we would call blading, which is kind of at an angle. Uh, but he's not turned away. He's still facing him. And at that point, Draca fires one round from the gun, and it strikes McLaughlin right here in the chest. Uh, McLaughlin then uh, grabs his chest and retreats back into the store. Uh, where he collapses, EMS responded. He was taken to Morton Plant Hospital where he was pronounced dead. Uh, Draca, uh, after he shot McLaughlin, took his firearm, uh, put it in his car, and waited for law enforcement to respond. Draca was cooperative, uh, and during the interview, uh, what he claimed was is, is that he had a verbal altercation, he was approached, he was slammed to the ground, and that he was in fear. And he felt, after being slammed to the ground, that the next thing was is that he was going to be further attacked by uh, McLaughlin. And that uh, he was focused on his, uh, McLaughlin's lower body, really couldn't see his hands, 
but he felt that the next thing was is that he was going to be slammed again and going to be uh, struck again and that he was in fear. So why don't we just, uh, it's very short, uh, play the video for you and then, uh, we'll have, then I'll continue on. So why don't we go ahead and do that. For uh, video TV purposes, how much are you showing? I'm going to show you the whole thing. I mean, it's short. I mean, it's, it's not even 15, probably, probably 15, 20 seconds, maybe tops. It's short. Up to the park where he's shot? Oh, you're going to see a shot. You're going to see him shot. Yeah, we can't. We don't want to show that. Okay. Well, I, I, there's no way to do it other than to, you, you really can't see. You can see him clutch, clutch his chest. But that's about all you can, that's about all you can see. I mean, you're not going to see, you're not going to see the, uh, there's no blood or anything. You guys can edit out what you want. But. That's the car pulling in over there. Okay, so this is a little longer version. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just so we can pull away. Sure. So that's Drake approaching uh, Jacobs. And you can see he's looking around the car. Uh, and he's looking for the handicap permit decal. Okay, so this is uh, McLaughlin coming out. So he's getting ready to push him, and then, then the shot's going to be fired. And right here. Okay, so that's the video. So. If you count it between the time the Drake goes to the ground and the time he shoots, it's a count of four seconds. It's a count of four, no more than five. It's a very short amount of time. And what he claims, and you can tell, it's a violent push to the ground. This isn't just a show. I mean, he slammed him to the ground. And he said when he's on the ground, because he's in fear, that the next thing that's going to happen is he's going to be reattacked uh, by McLaughlin, and he felt that he was at peril and that uh, he needed to shoot to defend himself. Um, McLaughlin was still standing there. Uh, he was still in front of him. He was he had the ability, uh, the capability uh, to do again or worse uh, what he had already done by pushing him to the ground. 
as I said, there was no verbalization uh, between either McLaughlin or by Draca uh, during this. And the law on stand your ground is clear, and the Florida legislature has spoken on this. And the Florida legislature has created a standard that is a largely subjective standard. This is not an objective, what I would do, what you would do, what the public would do, what somebody else would do. This is more of a subjective standard. And the person's subjective determination of the circumstance they were in, uh, the fear that they had, is relevant to the determination of whether they're justified in the use of force. So under these circumstances where you have somebody that is unprovoked, slammed to the ground like that, and his statement that he believed that uh, McLaughlin was going to come back at him, and he fired in a very short amount of time, a few seconds, four seconds probably, somewhere in that range, um, that is within the bookends uh, of stand your ground, and within the bookends of force being uh, justified. And the immunity that people are granted under the stand your ground law is just not an immunity from being charged, not just an immunity from being convicted, but it is an immunity from arrest. And I'm going to read this to you, and this is Florida Statute 776.032, and here's what it says under paragraph 2. A law enforcement agency may use standard procedures for investigating the use or threatened use of force, as described in subsection 1, but the agency may not arrest the person for using or threatening to use force unless it determines there is probable cause that the force that was used or threatened was unlawful. So we're precluded from making an arrest uh, in this type of a situation. Then it goes on to say that the court shall award a reasonable attorney's fees, court costs, compensation for loss of income, and all expenses incurred by the defendant in defense of any civil, civil action brought by the plaintiff if the court finds that the defendant uh, was immune from prosecution. So one, we ought to follow the law. Uh, two, if we don't follow the law, we're civilly liable uh, for not following the requirements of Florida stand your ground law. Importantly, the legislature this session changed the framework for stand your ground. The framework for stand your ground used to be that the defendant had to raise stand your ground as a defense and the defendant had the burden of proving that they were entitled to immunity under stand your ground. And the legislature changed the law and the law now is that the state attorney has the burden of proof by clear and convincing evidence that the defendant, the shooter, is not entitled to stand your ground. Nowhere else is there anything like this in criminal law where that somebody asserts something and the burden then proves to the other person or shifts to the other person. So the law has changed dramatically because You've got a situation here where stand your ground allows for a subjective belief by the person that they are in harm's way, they're in fear. In this case, this guy was slammed to the ground. In very short order, he felt it necessary, seconds, felt it necessary to defend himself because he felt he was going to be attacked again. And in order for him not to be uh, justified. You have to take it outside of those bookends. And we are precluded from making an arrest unless we have probable cause that the person committed a crime, and we don't have probable cause here of that. And even if we were to charge, or if the state attorney were to charge, all he has to do is say, stand your ground, and then the state attorney has the burden of proof by clear and convincing evidence at a stand your ground hearing that he is not entitled to stand your ground immunity. And that's a very heavy standard and it puts the burden on the state. So under these circumstances is that we cannot make an arrest. We're going to refer this to the state attorney's office. The state attorney's office will review it and apply the law to the facts and make a determination 
uh, as to whether uh, something should be charged. You know, before stand your ground, a case like this probably would have a different outcome. Um, you know, as you can see in there, uh, there is a pause, even if it's only for a couple seconds. There is a pause between the time Drake hits the ground and he shoots. Uh, that pause gives me pause. That pause gives me some concern. Uh, and it goes back to what I said when I opened. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. But I don't get to, and we don't get to, substitute our judgment for Drake's judgment. My question is, and what I have to do is make a determination, applying the law to the facts, is he within the framework of what the law allowed him to do? Does this law create a situation, potentially, uh, where people shoot first and ask questions later? Well, you can have that discussion. You can have that debate. I don't make the law. We enforce the law, and I'm going to enforce it the way it's written, the way the legislature is intended for it to be applied, and others can have the debate about whether they like it or not. So you know, this will go uh, to the state attorney. Draco will not be charged. He will not be arrested by us because we're precluded uh, from affecting an arrest. Uh, the state attorney will view it, and either he'll concur or not. And uh, if he concurs, then there'll be no charge, period. If he doesn't concur, then he'll make a determination uh, as to what to do with it. And if he feels like that he can overcome that heavy burden at a stand your ground hearing of proving by clear and convincing evidence uh, that Draco was not entitled uh, to use uh, force in this circumstance, then that's the state attorney's uh, determination to make. So, um, I just ask everybody to uh, understand, and there are a whole bunch of people I know uh, that, and I've already got emails about it, and people are already starting to voice concern over this. And I understand that. I don't make the law, but I will enforce the law, and I'll enforce it fairly as the legislature has directed that it be enforced. And under these circumstances, this fits uh, within the framework that the Florida legislature has crafted for all of us to live by in the state. I don't take any questions that you have. So you talked about that pause when he pushed him to the ground. There you counted four seconds, Sheriff. But he's not coming after him during during that pause. Doesn't matter. Show any more aggression? Can you kind of go? Doesn't that? matter because he's, this guy's on the ground, and, and and you know, no matter how you slice it or dice it, that was a violent push to the ground. That was a slam to the ground. So he you push him to the ground. He violently goes back on the ground, and he's sitting there. He takes the gun out. And what he's seeing and what he's saying in his mind is the next thing he's thinking is this guy's going to come at me again and he fires. And is that a, uh, is that within the bookends of a reasonable belief by his part, on his part under those circumstances of that time? Yeah, it's within the bookends. Now, it, you could say, is it on the fringe of the bookends? I don't know. I'll leave that to others to judge. But is it within the bookends? Is he uh, legitimately, could he be in fear after that violent slam to the ground? Could he be in fear that the next thing is that this guy's coming at him again when the guy's standing right there and he's standing right there like this? Yes, he could. And, you know, could, could he have said, hold him at gunpoint? Uh, and you could cut that both ways. He could hold him at gunpoint and not fire. Yeah, he, he probably could have done that. Uh, but also, the fact that he's holding him at gunpoint could also cut towards his legitimate fear. And that, you know, the guy didn't turn around and run away real fast. And the guy didn't do anything and said, hey, man, don't, you know, we're good or something. He didn't do any of that. So it, it cuts towards this guy's belief in his mind that he's going to be harmed again and he, he had to shoot to defend himself. You know, and those are the facts and that's the law. But there were no direct words between the two men that you know of. They didn't, no. And, and I'm not going to get into altering the facts because altering the facts alters the outcome. But if you were to engage in that exercise and you were to alter the facts further to the left or further to the right and you were to change this scenario, it could have a different income outcome. And if there were 
an exchange of information. And if the exchange of information was Mar uh, Marquise McLaughlin making threats to him, verbalizing and saying things that buttressed his belief that he was uh, in, in harm, in imminent, imminent harm, then that cuts more towards justifying the shooting. If Marquise McLaughlin was saying stuff like, hey man, we're good, and you know, forget about all this, then it cuts the other way. If you have longer time, like eight or 10 or 15 or 20 or seconds and McLaughlin had turned away, well then that changes the outcome. But we can't change the outcome, we cannot change the facts. The facts are is that he approached him, slammed him to the ground, and within about a four count, he fired. And no words were exchanged. We've got to use only the facts, and the facts are clear based upon video and eyewitness accounts. Speaking to the owner of the store, he tells us that the man who fired the shots is a nuisance there, that he's caused problems in the past with other people. Mm -hmm. um, do you know, are you familiar with this person? Have you been called there to deal with problems that he started in the past? Yeah, I'm not aware, Holly, that we have been called there to deal with him in the past. There have been some incidents in the past, uh, and we're aware of those incidents. But what's material here is what happened at that instant you know, and we have to recognize that if Marquise McLaughlin hadn't walked up to him the way he did and slammed him on the ground, we wouldn't be here having this discussion either. So what's relevant is not whether this guy's a good guy, nice guy, or whether he's a jerk, or whether he's a thorn in people's sides, and what he's done, whether it's three weeks ago, three months ago, or three years ago. What's relevant, and the only thing that we can look at here is was he in fear of further bodily harm because of what Maurice or Marquise McLaughlin did? And was he in an ability and have the capability to carry it out? And the answer is yes. So that's what we got to look at. And I'm not saying that this guy, he might well be a thorn in people's side. He might be a jerk. He might be all of those things. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. What, what matters is, did McLaughlin slam him to the ground? Yeah, he did. And was this guy put on his rear end? And was McLaughlin standing over him and in a position to do what he thinks McLaughlin was getting ready to do, which was to come at him again and, and harm him further? Yes. And does Florida law allow you to defend yourself and stand your ground? It does. That's what the Florida legislature has said. And so you know, our job and our role is uh, not to substitute our judgment uh, for the law and what the legislature has crafted as a framework, but to enforce it uh, equally and fairly as we're required to do. I, I'm not saying I agree with it, but I, I don't make that call. Do you disagree with it? Would you come out and say you disagree with well, it? Well, I'll say this, is that I, I am a firm believer in the adage that just because you can doesn't mean you should, but I'll also say this, is I'm not gonna substitute my judgment for Drake's judgment sitting on that ground after having been slammed to the ground either. And you know, and from his perspective, sitting there on the ground, and within a few seconds, literally, because he took the gun out and he had, he had to make, he made a decision. So it really doesn't matter what I would have done or what anybody else would have done. You know? And you know, what I've done something different, you know, there's a difference between, you know, arguably too, what a, you know, what a law enforcement officer would do, and this guy's not, he's just a citizen. He felt he had to defend himself. But Sheriff, where does the law come into play where, where he's running out thinking that his family is being threatened and he feels like he has to defend his family? There's no evidence of that. And again, you know, that's what you gotta be real careful with. You can't, you know, and I get the tendency, but you can't impute facts that don't exist. And there is no evidence, no testimony, no witness accounts that uh, his family uh, was in harm's way at all. It was purely verbal, purely verbal. And by all accounts, there was not even any threats. They were just arguing back and forth about the handicap spot. You know, and, and I'm guessing, but we can't unfortunately talk to Marquise because he's deceased, is what was going through his mind. He probably didn't like the fact, uh, and I don't think it takes a giant leap to get there, he didn't like the fact the way this guy was talking to his girlfriend. Uh, but also, you know, Marquise shouldn't have gone up and slammed him to the ground either. You know, he should have said, look, man, knock it off. You know, he, he didn't have a right. You know, Marquise engaged in unlawful conduct himself. Marquise should not have gone up and slammed this guy to the ground. You know, and 
Marquise wouldn't be dead if Marquise didn't slam this guy to the ground. So, you know, Marquise has got skin in this game too. And, and the reason why it makes it justified and within the framework of stand your ground is because of what Marquise did. It's sad. It's really sad. You know, and again, we can have a discussion about you know, what we would have done or what the law would be, or what we would have done under the law prior to stand your ground or prior to even uh, the change that puts the burden on the state and makes it a clear and convincing evidence standard. We can have those hypothetical discussions all day long, but we don't, I don't live in a hypothetical world. <laughs> I live in a world of what's the law, what are the facts, and how are we going to apply it as directed? And, and, and that's what we have to do. But is it, are you frustrated with, especially this change now that puts the burden of proof on the state attorney? Can you, can you tell us if that frustrates you and your job? You know, it, it, it's a mixed bag, I'd say. You know, I mean, there are times, I mean, you know, look, you know, people should be able to defend themselves. They should. There are times, and, and I can give you, again, we can come up with situations and scenarios where I do believe that stand your round has its place. And I think that it, it can be something that is properly used. You know, so as an example, you know, before stand your round, if somebody's walking in the mall parking lot and somebody comes up and attacks them, is that they're required uh, to make an effort at least or reasonably retreat before they can use force. You know, I don't think if somebody comes up to you in the mall parking lot and tries to rob you, uh, that before you can use force and defend yourself, that you should be required, there should be a requirement in the law to retreat first. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, 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 then you get the other end of the spectrum, which, you know, somebody can certainly make the case that maybe this guy could have handled this differently. But, so that's why you got a range and you got bookends. And you're going to have things that fall toward one end of the bookend or the other that aren't squarely in the middle. And I think there's an argument that this probably falls towards maybe one end of the bookend, but it doesn't take it outside the bookend. And it doesn't mean that you throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I see where there can be benefit and the right thing for people to be able to protect themselves. You know, look, nobody has a right to harm somebody else. Nobody has a right to commit a crime against somebody else. And, and, and no matter how you slice it, dice it, or otherwise, you've got to come back to is, is that Marquise McLaughlin wouldn't be dead unless Marquise McLaughlin slammed this guy to the ground. And, you know, don't put your hands on people. Don't slam them to the ground. And if you do, you're taking a chance that that person might be a concealed carry permit holder, and they might decide that they're in fear and they're going to defend themselves. <laughs> well. That's not, you know, that, that's the world we live in. So don't slam people to the ground. You know, and, you know, pe people have a right to, to do that, to defend themselves. How long do, you may not know this question, but how long do we think the state attorney's office is going to have with this investigation? I have no way of knowing that. I can't comment on that. You know, I mean, it'll take us a few days to package it all up and to do all the reports and to get everything together and then submit it to him. And then the state attorney will conduct his own investigation and uh, evaluate it. But uh, I can tell you that it, it, it's not gonna be short order. I mean, if that's what you're asking, are we talking you know, hours or days? Are we talking weeks or months? Well, it's not hours or days, and that'll be up to the state attorney to uh, make that determination. But I, I, I think it'll, it'll take them some time to evaluate it. Anything else? Okay. All right. All right. Yep.